nhiều thì uh, hôm nay uh, em rất cảm ơn cả nhiều người có quan tâm về thương mại và môi trường vì uh, ở Việt Nam có nhiều vấn đề và cũng có nhiều cơ hội và thách thức về môi trường và đầu tư uh, thì xin cảm ơn uh, nhiều em sẽ phát biểu một chút về cơ hội và thách thức môi trường của hiệp định tự do thương mại của Việt Nam sẽ phát biểu bằng tiếng Anh nhưng mà muốn đã được tiếng Việt vì đây là Việt Nam <cười> thì cảm ơn nhiều nhé. Um, so thank you everyone for coming today. I really appreciate um, how many people have an interest in uh, environmental issues related to Vietnam's free trade agreements. Um, like Ainwin mentioned, the director of Pan Nature. My name is uh, Nick Thor. I'm currently a policy researcher at uh, Pan Nature. And uh, today my presentation is going to focus on free trade agreements in particular, giving an overview about some of the opportunities and challenges um, within four major trade agreements that Vietnam has recently uh, signed on into. So to begin with, uh, an overview of the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about Vietnam's economic integration. Um, before going on to uh, looking at opportunities of selected free trade agreements, before finally taking a look at some of the challenges of free trade agreements, specifically related to uh, environmental and legal challenges. So to begin with, in terms of Vietnam's economic integration, um, I wanted to point out uh, this figure uh, related to GDP growth. So as we can see, starting in 1986, in December 1986, the Sixth Party Congress of Vietnam decided to introduce Doi Moi, uh, which instituted the opening up of Vietnam's economy. Um, so as you can see, in 1986, the growth rate was at 3.36%, um, had a high of 9.54% in 1995, and then uh, in the past year, it surpassed expectations and went to 6.6% in 2015. The World Bank forecasts for 2016 to 2018, the forecasted growth rates can be 6.3% for a number of reasons, including foreign direct investment, robust growth and confidence in the markets, uh, labor markets as well. Uh, some key uh, moments within Vietnam's economic integration include uh, joining ASEAN in 1995, uh, normalizing the US and Vietnam relations in 1995 as well, joining APEC in 1998, and then uh, joining the WTO, the World Trade Organization, in January 2007. And then in 2009, the World Bank uh, classified Vietnam as a lower middle income country. And so this, this is just to provide uh, a context into the rapid economic growth that Vietnam has experienced over the past 30 years and is hoping to continue to sustain through free trade agreements. So next I wanted to point out some international trade and goods because a lot of the growth, uh, the, uh, a lot of the GDP growth has been due mainly due to exports as well as imports um, that opening up the economy came through. So from 2000 to 2014, international trade and goods increased by 900%. And so as you can see here, there's been a very steady increase in total trade of, of goods, um, particularly in exports. Uh, products such as coffee, rice, textiles, and apparel, some of the main econ uh, commodities that continue to sustain uh, Vietnam's economy. And currently, one of the reasons why Vietnam has been able to uh, export and import so many of its goods has been due to free trade agreements and economic liberalization. So currently, Vietnam has 15 free, to tra free trade agreements that's, that it's either signed and are currently in effect, that it's signed, but not yet in effect, that it's negotiated and concluded negotiations, or that it's currently uh, negotiating. And so, as you can see, a lot of the initial free trade agreements that Vietnam signed on into uh, were ASEAN free trade agreements. When Vietnam joined in 1995, when it also joined the ASEAN free trade area, and then uh, afterwards, ASEAN started uh, negotiating free trade agreements with some major partners. Uh, currently, Vietnam has taken a more indivi individual initiative uh, by joining uh, trade negotiations for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, for example, the, the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, 
uh, a free trade agreement with the European Union, one with, this, with South Korea. And so there's a number of free trade agreements that Vietnam has currently signed on into. Uh, the next slide will point out uh, the fact that there are currently four free trade agreements in negotiation. This includes RCEP, the Regional, uh, economic, or Ep Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, a free trade agreement with Israel, along with the European Free Trade Association, as well as an ASEAN agreement with Hong Kong. Now, these are all at different parts of the negotiating process, but it's just interesting to know that even though Vietnam has recently concluded negotiations with the TPP, of the EU-Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, and others, there's a whole host of other free trade agreements that Vietnam's hoping to, to get online uh, very soon. And to point out some of the major uh, trade that Vietnam has with its uh, recently concluded free trade agreements, I wanted to point out uh, some of the growth that's happened just in the past uh, five years, since uh, 2010. So from 2010 to 2014, across the board for TPP countries, for China, for countries uh, involved in ASEAN, the European Union, and South Korea, Vietnam's trade to all of these major partners has increased. In some cases, uh, such as China, uh, the European Union, as well as South Korea, trade has almost doubled. Um, in the case of China and South Korea, it's been mainly because of imports coming into Vietnam. Uh, in the case of the Trans-Pacific Partnership countries, which includes 12 countries from the Asia Pacific region, uh, the reason why trade has increased so much is because of exports mainly to the United States as well as Japan. And over the past four years, specifically in the DPP countries, uh, which in 2014 accounted for roughly 40% of Vietnam's total exports, uh, growth has increased 75% from 2010 to 2014. So across the board, trade with the major trading partners of recently concluded free trade agreements um, continues to increase, and Vietnam is hoping to continue to see its exports increase to these partners, as well as imports from these partners, due to liberalization of, and elimination of uh, tariffs and, and reduction of uh, technical barriers to trade. Uh, so the next section that we're going to focus on are some of the opportunities related to the free trade agreements. And like I mentioned, we're going to focus on four uh, main ones in general. Uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the EU Free Trade Agreement, ASEAN Economic Community, as well as the South Korea-Vietnam uh, Free Trade Agreement. So to begin with, I wanted to point out the, just a bit of an overview about the Trans-Pacific Partnership which as we know was recently in the news with Obama's visit and has constantly been in the news as one of the most controversial and groundbreaking free trade agreements that's happened in 20 years since the creation of NAFTA or the EU, uh, or the EU area. So to begin with, the Trans-Pacific Partnership represents 40% of the global GDP as well as one-third of international trade. TPP partners, uh, which like I said are across the Asia-Pacific region, uh, account for one-fourth of global seafood trade, as well as one-fourth of trade in pulp and paper and timber. And so, because of that reason, the TPP has a robust environmental chapter that covers a number of topics. Now, whether you want to look at whether those topics are actually legally binding and enforceable is another topic in itself. Um, but it is important to know that environment is one of the, the main uh, sort of talking points of government representatives from across the region. For the TPP, a lot of people say that it will accelerate domestic reforms here in Vietnam, as well as help Vietnam to sort of meet its goal of becoming a modernized and industrial nation by 2020. Uh, the World Bank, as well as uh, the Peterson Institute for International Economics, has stated that Vietnam is going to widely benefit economically from uh, the free trade agreement, in particular redu reduction and elimination of tariffs with the United States and other trade partners. The World Bank said that by 2030, Vietnam's GDP could increase by 10% and exports could increase by 17%. The Peterson Institute gave that about 11% for increase in real incomes and close to 30% for an increase in exports. So as you can see, the Trans-Pacific Partnership itself will widely benefit uh, Vietnam's economy. 
The next free, free trade agreement is the EU Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, which uh, EU Trade Commissioner Cecilia Malmström described as the first high standard trade agreement with a developing country, and that it sets new rules for the EU's new free trade agreements with developing countries, such as with Vietnam. Um, so uh, the EU Vietnam Free Trade Agreement it consists of 18 chapters, one of which is a trade and sustainable development chapter. Um, and then the European Chamber of Commerce described the, this free trade agreement as increasing uh, the GDP of Vietnam by 15% and exports to the European Union by almost 35% upon full uh, implementation and the reduction and elimination of tariffs. The ASEAN Economic Community, which went into effect in uh, December 31st, 2015, uh, creates a, a free flow of goods, services, investment, capital, as well as people, uh, with the aim of making ASEAN as a region more connected and one that can take advantage of its economic benefits. Currently, it's the world's seventh largest economy, if you take ASEAN altogether as one economy. And some estimates by the Asian Development Bank put it as the fourth largest if current trends continue by 2050. Uh, the, ASEAN, the ASEAN Asian Development Bank also mentioned that uh, the ASEAN economic community could increase the GDP of ASEAN, the region itself, by 7.1%, and in Vietnam particularly, by 14.5% by 2025. And then finally, the South Korea-Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, which went into effect uh, December 20th, 2015, uh, is an attempt to foster a closer relationship between Vietnam and one of Vietnam's largest tr uh, trading partner, in particularly imports from South Korea, as well as Vietnam's largest uh, foreign direct investor. And as we know, foreign direct investment is something that former Prime Minister Nguyen Thanh Xuân really wanted to focus on in terms of continuing Vietnam's robust economic growth. Uh, former uh, Minister of Trade and, uh, and Investment, uh, Vu Huang, Vu Huang Hui, Vu Huang Hui, right? Something like that. He, uh, he mentioned that he wanted to increase economic growth uh, and hoped that the South Korea-Vietnam Free Trade Agreement would increase bilateral trade to $70 billion by 2020 up from $28.9 billion in uh, 2014. And so that would be an increase of almost double uh, with only six years. Now, the, the only issue with the South Korea-Vietnam uh, Free Trade Agreement in comparison to some of the other free trade agreements that Vietnam is negotiating, as well as has recently signed in, on into, is that it's, it's a very standard free trade agreement. It doesn't really mention too much about labor or other social provisions such as the environment that uh, agreements such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, as well as the EU one, have made very central to the reasons why they should pass and why they are groundbreaking. And so even with all of these economic opportunities that Vietnam could have, there's a number of challenges when it comes to free trade. And I think that Vietnam is a very interesting case study for taking a look at the role that foreign direct investment plays in Vietnam, and unfortunately, sometimes the power and leverage that foreign direct investment has over communities, as well as environmental sustainability. So I just wanted to mention and outline a few of the legal and environmental challenges that can, sort, that can serve sort of as a basis for our discussion later on today. Um, one of the first challenges is essentially effectively enforcing environmental laws and regulations within Vietnam that already exist and especially in industries that are set to expand, such as textiles, footwear, and seafood, which as we know also have huge environmental consequences if they aren't followed correctly. If wastewater is just put in rivers and put in oceans, if dyeing of textiles isn't properly regulated. And so that's gonna be a major challenge for Vietnam, especially because one of the aspects of the environment chapter of the TPP, for example, that is enforceable, is enforcing your own environmental laws and regulations that you already have on the book. Another aspect is adhering to the TPPs as well as the EU Vietnam Free Trade Agreement's environmental standards, some of which are legally binding and enforceable, and others which are not so much and more voluntary, 
that could come down to the will of the Vietnamese government as well as TPP member countries. The next is related to threats in governing the public interest at the national and provincial levels. And this has been one of the most controversial aspects of free trade agreements more recently. Um, and this is related to the investor state dispute settlement resolution, which I'm going to go into just briefly in the next uh, in the next slide. Essentially, this is extremely controversial, even though it has been included in over 3,000 bilateral investment treaties and free trade agreements. But many non-governmental non organizations and civil society argue that this ISDS dispute resolution gives a lot of power to investors. It doesn't necessarily allow the government to regulate in the public interest. The next uh, challenge for Vietnam is related to getting into this middle income trap. As we've talked about, a lot of the commodities that Vietnam currently exports are very in low-skilled areas. Textiles and agriculture, not necessarily in some, or some of the higher-skilled areas. Well, Vietnam is having a more... Uh, uh, boosting its electronic industry, for example, it's not at the same level as many people will say uh, the textile industry or the footwear industry or the seafood industry will expand because of these free trade agreements. So ActionAid in its uh, recent report on the EU-Vietnam uh, free trade agreement outlines this middle income trap of attempting to not have Vietnam just become a manufacturing um, area of some of these lower skilled uh, products. And then finally, uh, there's issues that have to deal with land grabbing and land use compensation that occur at the local level. And my colleague, Chi Pui, will talk a little bit more about some of those issues um, related to foreign investors coming into Vietnam. And then one last challenge that I wanted to mention is essentially coordination among different government ministries and government agencies when it comes to implementing these free trade agreements and understanding the provisions within those trade agreements sort of collaborating and working together um, with civil society as well as the private sector. And so my last uh, slide to sort of conclude this presentation is talking about one of the major threats that people see in free trade agreements. Um, and in particular, I think the Vietnamese government and, and certain stakeholders in Vietnam also find this to be a major threat, considering Vietnam's lack of experience with the investor state dispute settlement. Um, Currently, uh, the Investor State Dispute Settlement Resolution is essentially a way to protect foreign investors in a country that may not have necessarily the perfect rule of law or be able to completely protect investor rights. Um, and that could be because, because of a social conflict, political issues, instability of, of the economy as well as the government. And so essentially, ISDS is meant to allow investors challenge governments when they feel that their profits are infringed upon. When they feel like certain standards, such as national treatment, most favored nation treatment, minimum standard of treatment, or expropriation occur within a country. Now, as I said, Vietnam has only had four ISDS cases, um, two of which have been settled in favor of Vietnam, one of which is pending, and then one of which I believe was, uh, was settled in general. Um, I wanted to point out the McKenzie versus Vietnam case before going into Bill Kong versus Canada. So essentially, McKenzie versus Vietnam, there was an investor of South Fork a company in Binh Duong province um, in the south central region of Vietnam. He wanted to build a resort. Um, but government officials uh, gave him the license, but he supposedly did not complete the construction of, this, of the, the resort or not necessarily meet uh, his project plans. So the government of Vietnam, at the provincial level, decided to give a license to a Vietnamese company to take a look at some of the minerals that were on the same land. Now, Michael McKenzie said that this was a breach of a number of issues, such as appropriation uh, and different treatment levels. And so in November 2010, he launched an ISDS case of $3.75 billion um, against the government of Vietnam. The government of Vietnam, through the Ministry of Justice, said that Michael McKenzie had no grounds to actually launch the case and that the ISDS tribunal uh, didn't have the jurisdiction to hear the case. Uh, and in December 2013, the, tri the tribunal agreed with the Vietnamese government in saying that McKenzie didn't have the power to bring this up into an ISDS case. 
But this is the most, uh, most relevant as well as the one that has uh, uh, been in the, in the media the most is related to this case, McKenzie versus Vietnam. And because of the fact that there, this is only one of four cases, uh, many people are worried that as Vietnam continues to integrate economically, continue to have robust economic growth and pass regulations and different legislation, that there's going to be challenges related to ISDS, one of which can be related to an environment. And that goes into the Bill Kong versus Canada case. Uh, Bill Kong is a, is a concrete company that uh, its family is based in Delaware, I believe. And after the Canadian government decided that their concrete plants in Nova Scotia would have a devastating effect on the environment as well as the communities, the, the government of Canada decided to not allow their project to go through after a, a robust environmental impact assessment by the government of Canada at the local level. But in May 2008, Bill launched a, US, uh, a three, uh, $300 million case against the government of Canada, basically saying that the environmental impact assessment and the assessment of their uh, plans of creating a concrete quarry, um, as well as shipping um, along a major river uh, in, in an area in Nova Scotia, um, was, a minimum, was a violation of minimum standard of treatment um, national treatment as well as most, most favored nation. Now this case uh, was settled in March 2015 in the tribunal, two of the three people on the tribunal uh, ruled that Canada did violate minimum standard of treatment because of the fact that they had this environmental impact assessment and the environmental impact assessment essentially said that the government of Canada should uh, reject the project. Now it's unclear whether it's whether the government of Canada is going to pay the private company $300 million. But this is just one of many cases that um, civil society groups argue is a good example of how uh, environment regulations sometimes can be a threat and a reason to launch an ISDS case. Now that's a completely other topic to discuss. And you could have an entire workshop, an entire you know, PhD studying just that. Um, but I just wanted to sort of leave us here um, with some of these challenges as well as opportunities uh, for some of the free trade agreements. And even though Vietnam will likely benefit highly economically, we have to ask what are the costs? What are the risks? What are the risks for community? What are the risks for environmental sustainability? And um, with that, I'm going to end my presentation. And thank you so much.